Welcome to People Love Process. I get asked a lot, how do I come up with ideas? That's kind of a loaded question of sorts because what works for me might not work for others. I'm going to start with my favorite illustrative designer of all time. That's Saul Bass. That's who you see here. And Saul Bass had one of the best quotes in our industry. And he said, design is thinking made visual. So how you think will either help or hinder your creative ideas. So in this movie, I'm going to share with you a way to approach a project and how you can formulate your thoughts to improve your ideation efforts. Uh, this is actually a lot of fun, and I think it's going to help you a lot. So yes, we're going to be going over some vector stuff by um, applying this principle, but then executing on the principle. We'll, we'll do that, of course, too. But not everything can be accomplished within an application like Illustrator or Photoshop or whatever. Uh, a lot of what we need to do as a creative is everything that takes place before we actually use a computer. And I think that's part of the problem in our industry is too many people jump on the computer too soon. So this is gonna be beneficial to your entire creative process and I just wanted to say that before we jump into it. So what am I going to go over? Well, I'm going to go over what I call concept math. Um, think of it as if you're kind of um, a sci-fi fan, a Jedi mind trick for graphic designers of sorts. You know, these are the ideas you're looking for type of thing. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore what I just said. Some of you might get it. Okay, so how does this work? Well, it's best showing than explain. So let's just jump right into it. Let's say you're approached by an agency and the agency says, I want you to design um, a branding for a local municipality in Chicago. And uh, they want that. And by the way, that town was Aurora. And they want a landmark kind of worked into the design you come up with. And it's this landmark bridge. It's very iconic. It's well known. And they, they want that worked in somehow. So you take a landmark and maybe you add an indigenous species for that area, like an egret. And then that helps you come up with the final logo. So that's all I did is I focused on iconifying uh, a landmark, which is the bridge, and iconifying, obviously it has to be the same styling as the rest of the mark uh, for the, the local um, indigenous uh, bird in that area who you can actually see in the river by, by that landmark, and that's the egret. And then I pick colors that work well for that, that area as well. And so this is the village of North Aurora. Now you can do further. All this is as well is also shape recognition. Now, the, is this exactly like that photo of the bridge? No, it's supposed to represent it. It doesn't have to be exact. But at times, this principle of thinking, this way of thinking, adding elements and objects and themes and, and uh, basically... Um, characteristics and thinking of those visually and then doing that math of how could I relate those to one another is going to reveal ideas you might not have ever thought of because I saw this and I didn't intend on doing this but I go well this is a great shape and with that nesting shape and the bird you know popping out of it that makes it a, a little more unique but it can also be shape recognition to work as the letter O in North as well. So I showed him both directions. So that's what we're going to be doing here. Now I'm going to go over a bunch of examples here. Then we'll, we'll uh, uh, do another one and walk through the, the creative process. So here's another one. Uh, this is a face profile. There is a client. They live in Portland, um, north of me. Uh, she's a massage therapist, but she also has isolation tanks. And if you're not familiar with those, just think of going into a tank full of water and you just float and it's complete silence. And they might have some music they're pumping in, but I think of somebody relaxing and the side view or the face profile of somebody who's floating in the water, it makes me think of an island. 
So a face plus an island is what helped me come up with this idea for her business and her branding. So float north. Um, let's take a look at another one. This client wanted something that's patriotic. And he said, I definitely want it patriotic. I want to use the patriotic colors for the United States, but I want it to be somehow be worked into an animal. And that animal is the lion. So you have the American flag plus a lion equals the brand mark that this group loved. So that's all it takes and how you think about it. Um, it, for me, it made more sense making the stars on the bottom since I could make that area bigger and it would fill the stars. It would look a little awkward if those stars were on top, in my opinion. So there's challenges when you do this, but the core ideas and the premise and kind of thinking through how it's going to now communicate is all part of the process. So let's take a look at another one. Uh, this was through another agency, and that agency wanted me to do uh, some brand exploration for a client of theirs, which was a dairy council. And um, so the name of that dairy council was just called Dairy West, and they represent all the dairy farms in on the Western Hemisphere of the United States. And so obviously I think of milk when it comes to dairy. Well, where does milk come from? I think of cows. And it's Dairy West. So West made me think, well, in context of cows and milk, I think of a weather vane you might see on top of a, of a, um, a barn. And if you take all of those and how could you compose those together to form something, it helped me come up with this direction. Now, the milk was just where I started. It's not like I have to show milk anywhere in this. But I really like how this came out. So this was one of those direction. I also like the shape association with the dot and the letter I, which just works really well with the weather vane. So uh, that was one of the directions I came up with. Here's another one. This one's um, a little more conceptual. And this is where when you have a great client, really appreciate them. Um, I've been working with Randy, who's the client here for years, branded his first technology company way back. He grew it over seven years, sold it to the uh, Department of Homeland Security's defense contractor. And then he became a maverick entrepreneur, uh, created, did all the branding for all of his various his businesses he started up. And after all of that, he wanted to start a new tech net company. And he said, hey, Vaughn. I got an idea for a, a, a tech company that I'm going to be starting up. I want you to design the identity for it. And I want it based off of a dragonfly. And I go, why is that? And this is where his thinking's really good. He's a really good creative thinker, even though he, he couldn't design if his life depended on it. He's really good at, at coming up with ideas. Uh, he said, well, a uh, dragonfly eyes can almost see 360 degrees, and I'm developing uh, artificial intelligence software that will help uh, detect threats on the server side and network side of things. And I think a dragonfly would be the perfect visual metaphor. And I'm going, that's like a really cool idea. Yeah, I can work with that. So dragonfly, you know, the other context here is is stopping hackers from hacking into a network. So how would I work that out with the Dragonfly as a theme? Well, this is what I came up with. His business was called Counterflow AI, and we just use those little veins that are in the wings, which kind of look like circuits if you look at them. And that's what gave me the idea to, to add those in the wings. And he grew this company over five years. And two years ago, I was on LinkedIn and I see a post and it announces that this company had just acquired Counterflow. And I'm like, holy cow, he's two for two. I can't believe he did it again. You know, and then I'm going, well, that kind of sucks. Now I'm, like, I'm not going to have the client anymore. Well, it was only four months later and he contacts me and says, Vaughn, I'm starting a new company and I want you to brand it for me. 
And I go, sure, what is it? Well, he lives in a beautiful area of the country on the East Coast, and this is what's called um, Rockfish Valley. And he goes, well, there's this area where I live, Rockfish Valley. It is beautiful. He's going, that's where the name was, uh, the, what gave me the, the idea for the name. So I want to call my company Rockfish Robotics. He's going, we're still going to do um, artificial intelligence software, but it's no longer going to be for threat assessment. This is for agricultural robots. I'm going, okay, that's like way out there. Um, sure, I can work with that. And it's based off of Rockfish Valley. Well, I did some research uh, to find out what exactly is a rockfish. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into why they named it Rockfish Valley, but it kind of made sense uh, learning the, the, the history of how that name came about. But it is based off of a rockfish, a fish. So location for the name, what does a rockfish look like? Well, this is a good example. Uh, uh, almost looks like a lingcod. Where I grew up in the Pacific Northwest, we have fish kind of like this, but they're called lingcod. But it looks pretty much the same. Uh, very spiny uh, dorsal fins. I love the, the orange coloring, and that actually gave me uh, an idea to use that color in the, the direction I was going to propose. And of course, so you have location plus fish plus robotics, because that's what it's going to be used for, is to uh, basically guide and direct these robotics who go through crops. And they even have bigger devices that are entire giant tractors uh, just to automate some of the, the, the farming they do um, in the agricultural industry. So all of those things played a part in me coming up with this design direction where I kind of made it kind of like that rockfish and I played off of that spiny look, but I worked some of that element of circuitry into it leading into his eye. And I was kind of happy with coming up with the, the code because all code is is ones and zeros if you get down to the source. And I made that the bubbles of the fish. Now, between this and the one he ended up going with, he was having a hard time picking which one he likes best. And um, he picked another direction, but that's okay. Um, I like both of them regardless. So uh, let's take a look at another example. What do you get if you take a hammer plus a plant plus a branded green color for the company? Well, it might lead to Sustainable Contractors Association. So this is all it is. It's uh, Think of it as helping you to figure out those aspects, those conceptual components that are going to make up a design. Let's take a look at a more complicated uh, um, equation using the same principle. This was a Slovakian uh, a brewery, and he found me somehow online. He contacted me. He goes, I'm from Slovakia, and uh, the name of um, our company is called Trot. And I go, what, what's that name mean? Well, it's named after this mythological character who fought the, the, the winged serpent with a golden battle axe. So I'm going, okay, golden battle axe. I can work with that. I can work with a T. And then rode off in victory um, uh, with lightning, with thunders of, with thunder and lightning on his horse. And then he just mentioned in the brief he filled out, um, I also like the shield, kind of like the shield on our on our uh, country flag. And I go, okay, so a T plus a battle ax plus a thunderbolt plus a shield. I think I can work with that. And it ended to this being his final logo for Trot Brewery. And it looks very impactful when you view it on a dark background with lightning going down, just like Trot did when he won his victory. So this is the principle I use all the time. Now, do I source out photos like this? Well, only if it's something I have to create like or or brand in a in a graphic sense to look at the realistic and kind of simplify and deduce the shape and form. But mostly it's in my head. I'm writing stuff down. Ooh, that's a good idea. I write down fish, write down this, write down that. And then those are the components I start working with. It's just a way to facilitate thought and to get the creative process uh, kind of kick-started. Now, let's take a look at another one, and then we'll go ahead and build it out as well. And in all of these things I'm showing you is symbolism. 
of sorts and how they can relate to one another. Now, the world is replete with all kinds of amazing uh, companies, businesses. Um, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with. This principle can be applied to it. In the case that I'm going to take you through here, this some of the research I did on my own revealed other things that I thought were cool. Um, I had read an article and they recently they found this mosaic that was buried. Um, it, it was uh, uh, created around 380 and they were doing some remodeling in an area, this over in Europe, obviously, and they dug this up. It's a mosaic. And what's cool is it has a uh, uh, image of Christ in it, but behind him is this XP, which is Greek. And around the same period on a coin, you have XP. And in Greek, the character actually are these two forms together. Well, X and P also make up the first two letters in the name of Christ when it's typed out in Greek. So I thought that was cool. This is a historic symbol that, uh, once again, dates back to around 345 AD, I think it was. And this is one they found around that same time period. Um, through the course of history, uh, the fish has become a symbol um, uh, in Christianity as well. And if you look down here, here's another archaeological find where they have the fish, but they also have... Um, an anchor. And so I was approached to design a t-shirt uh, for a certain, um, <clears throat> a certain company. And I started thinking about uh, these ideas myself. So that's when I started researching some of these things. And an idea hit me on what would make a really cool uh, t-shirt, in this case, for a ministry. And that's where I just started drawing. And once again, I don't go looking for images specifically before I start drawing. I have a general idea. If I asked everybody watching this video, hey, grab a pencil, draw a cat. I'm not telling you how accurate it had to be, but in general, could each of you draw a cat? Well, of course you could. I don't know anybody that couldn't just draw a simple little crude doodle of a cat. It could just be the cat's head, that's fine. That's all I'm talking about here. I'm not saying you have to become an illustrator, but drawing in this capacity is about facilitating your thinking. Drawing actually improves cognition skills, but I'm not going to uh, get into that. That's a different talk altogether. But I was thinking anchor, a dove, a cross. Maybe you can, you know, the top of an anchor already kind of looks like a cross. Maybe the bottom part of an anchor kind of reflects a dove in terms of its wings and its form. Here I kind of draw it out a little more. And these aren't perfect drawings, but as soon as I did this, I'm going, oh, I like this. This is, I think, going to work good. So I did a rough drawing where I tried to draw it out a little more refined to guide me, but I'm not worried too much about it being super precise. You can see this isn't even at a horizontal angle. It's slanted down. Uh, that's okay. Um, the part I'm most concerned about in terms of getting the shape right was the bottom of the anchor here. These up here can be easily made with um, the rectangle tool and the ellipse tool up here. So I'm not gonna worry about that. Now, once I get to this point, and again, I'm gonna tell you, one of your best investments, if you don't have one, is a flatbed scanner. So I take the drawing, scan it in. So what I end up with is this. And of course, on all my drawings, I'm gonna be building upon, I go to the transparency palette. In this case, I set it for 20%, lock the layer, and I'm just gonna start building on top of it. The best place to start for me when it comes to vector building is to do the easy stuff first. So the circles are a no-brainer. Dropping a guide down will guide us. Ah, guide us. Get it? <laughs> um, uh, these, these are the easy shapes to discern in this design specifically. Now, I didn't want the um, kind of the the central point of the anchor to be one weight going all the way down. I gave it an ever so slight tapering just so it's somewhat of an angle of, of sorts. Uh, but I didn't even think of something else until I started building this and I'm going, wait a minute, if I'm going to put the word hope in this, which is what I want to do, 
how am I going to put this over it? I'm going, I wish I had it broken here. And I started creating another bar like this here. And then I'm going, oh, wait a minute. And it made me think of another association. And that is, I could make that the top and bottom of a Bible. And I go, I didn't even think of that when I was first sketching it out. So those are good things to think about because you never know what you're, you're going to discover when you do that. So in this case, simple shape building, uh, this is the type of thing where I'd take this and I'd trim it because I want this at a subtle angle. This is flaring out ever so subtly, but as it goes out here, I want it to flare a little more like that. I think that'll work. Um, so we'll take this, we'll take these elements and I'm going to clone it, Command-C, Command-F. I'll find a central anchor point. Use the Reflect tool. This is where you want to have Smart Guides turned on, Command-U. And we'll reflect everything over like that. I don't need the center part of the down bar here because that's going to be kind of, uh, the type's going to run over that. So I'll just trim that out. So I have all of these elements like this. I'll select all of these. Actually, we need to make a donut of this shape. Make sure that's on top. Select this, minus front. So now we have a donut. We can select all of these. Go up here to Unite. Notice when you do that on your appearance panel, it's gonna group. So I always change that to a compound. If you don't know how to change a compound, just go to Object, down to Compound Path, and then make, actually, let's select that. Go object, compound path, make. Notice I have F7, keyboard shortcut. So I never go there and do that. It saves so much time. Now, one thing people would think is you always have to use the pin tool for curves. And I had somebody ask me this, and I've been waiting to have a good example. Well, this is a good example to show you how you don't always have to do absolute curves with the pin tool um, kind of organically. Uh, here we are where I look at the general angle of my drawing and this is all I have to do. These are straight lines. How many people here couldn't build straight lines like this in Illustrator? All of you can. Super easy. Uh, you just grab the pin tool, dunk, it automatically draws straight lines. So if you can't do that, then I don't know, maybe you need to get into hotel management or something. That's the easiest part of vector building. So I want to show you how you can set it up like this. And notice I'm paying attention to this angle, but as it gets over here, I purposely went by the side. I didn't go down the same path because as it tapers into this, I don't want it to be it, well, it's easier to show you after the fact. Let me do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to a plugin. Well, now first, let's do it natively in Illustrator. So if I'm doing this, I click here, I'd find a wherever it comes to a point, gets a point, and then I click here. Then I go to the anchor point tool. You can grab the path and you can bend this. I want to put a subtle curve in this part like that. Boom. Not hard at all. Let's go ahead and undo that because guess what? Since I found this plugin on this type of stuff, I don't even do that. It, it's just, it, it actually uh, is, it doesn't work as well as the, the plugin I use. So I'm going to go to the plugin I use, which is Arch by Points Tool. And I'll click here. I'll click here. You can bend it. Click here. Click here. And I'll bend it. Now that plugin is called uh, uh, Subscribe by Astute Graphics. Uh, you might want to check that out. That, it, I use that all the time. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, we're going to do some rounding. Now, I could use the Astute Graphic Rounding Tool, which is called the, the Corner Widget or uh, Dynamic Corners, but you don't need to. We're just going to use the native one, the Corner Widget in AI, and on this one, boom, you have that curve. Perfect. That's why I built it straight. Let's do that again. Notice this and the more you start getting used to building this way, you can figure out a lot of ways to save time. Like that, we'll go to this one. And we'll round this one like that. And notice how it terminates here. I didn't want it to be here. Then it gets really narrow here, and I don't like that. So I think this looks better. The same reason I'm going over the center line here. 
is I think it looks better terminating here instead of down here, like that. So all we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and close, oops, let's go ahead and close this like that. I think we got that one. Now all I'm going to do is I'll grab a central anchor point. I'll just draw a shape for no other reason than trimming this bottom of the anchor. Go to Pathfinder minus front. Go ahead and clone it. Command C, Command F. Find a central anchor point. Reflect it over like that. Now we'll take all of our shapes and we can even go and turn off a rough sketch now and we'll go ahead and unite all these shapes together like that and we have everything needed for our final artwork so that's not hard to do whatsoever and oh i just oh nuts i just realized i screwed up um i forgot to round this last part oh, okay here we go let's that's easy we'll just round it so uh once again Another mistake, because I'm not paying attention as I'm talking. I do the best job I can, but I, I'm sorry. I'm going to make those mistakes. So let's go to Pathfinder and Unite. But not hard. Super easy uh, workflow. Uh, but whenever you look at shapes and you're trying to figure out what's the best way to create them, don't just think you have to gravitate to the pen tool all the time. There's so many things you can do with shape building. And the anchor bottom, this is more free-flowing but you can still pull it off if you think in shapes now this is our base art filled with black and this is where i want to do some simple type exploration the word i'm going to use with this design is hope so i literally just start typing out hope in different um, styles of fonts just to kind of look at it and figure out which way i want to go now i want something that's very extended and some of these are a little too tall. Like, I don't mind this, st this style, but it's a little too short. This one's a little too, um, I don't know. I just don't, didn't think that worked. After looking at all these, this one I was looking at, um, but then I decided, no, it's not as beefy as I want it. These are beefy, but they're pretty plain. And this is the one I gravitated towards right here. This specific font is Serpentine. Now, this font has been around a long time. And by default, this is what the font looks like typed out. Now, we have this here. And the reason why I have that is I'm just going to slide this over and point something out. Now, it's not a huge thing. But if I zoom up, notice how that center point on the H is actually a little bigger than the center point on the E. You can see how it's not quite as uh, tall as the other one. I just wanted to point that out. So once I noticed that, I realized I'm not even sure. I I think this could be beefier, the, the crossbar on the H and the arms on the E and stuff. And that's when I go... I think I need to extend it. So what's shown below in blue is a copy of this. And then this is how I extended that. I made those weights um, thicker on the crossbar of the H, on the arms of the E, and on the top and bottom of the O, and on the top extended part of the P, and the bottom part of the extended part of the P as well. So those are things I did. Now, what I tried to do by doing that is, one, make the word more extended and substantial, but also improve the continuity. So if I turn this on, you can see all of these are exactly the same weight, which I think uh, looks and works a lot better. Now, when I lock it up uh, with, my, uh, with my mark that I created with the anchor, this is what it looks like. I think that's looking good. And it's usually at this point, I'll set something aside, come to it later and look at it. And when I did, I thought the anchor should go down just a little more, like the point should extend down a little more. And so that's what I did. I just made that edit uh, just to extend it a little more. I think that looks good. And 
another thing I did from this point is I was looking at it and this is going to feel really, really nitpicky, but just hold with me. The ribbon coming off of the Bible, I thought I need to reposition that. So it went from this to this and you're going, what's well, not that big a deal. Why'd you do that? Well, this comes to what I call associative alignment. If I drop a guide here, you can see it goes from the side of the P right into visually, your eye flows right into the side of um, the ribbon coming out of the Bible. Is that a big thing? No, but it's something that I usually pay attention to. And I try to uh, do that because I've just found it just harmonizes with all the graphics when you pay attention to that level of detail. It just makes things flow and work better. Uh, is it a mandatory thing? No, it's just kind of what I do. So here's the final base art with um, all the type in place. I think this is uh, gonna work really well. In this case, I'd want it um, this nice blue color on maybe it's a white or a um, kind of a gray sweatshirt of sorts. So again, if you think in visual sense, regardless of what your your industry, what uh, what genre it is, what in, uh, what type of company, product, or service it is thinking about those attributes and characteristics and objects that relate to that specific project and that specific client is going to help you solve how to solve it graphically, uh, creatively speaking. So we had an anchor plus a dove plus a cross plus a Bible to get to our final design is shown here. And I think this design looks even better uh, on a on a darker background that kind of goes with the overall theme as well. So many designs can come up, many designers that is, can come up with great ideas, but those ideas suffer from poor craftsmanship and execution. But others might execute the idea with precision, but lack a unique or clever idea that they've used. The challenge is to do both equally well. The more you apply the methods I showcased, um, I showcased in this movie, the easier it gets. And over time, you'll just become it'll just become a natural part of your own creative process. The shape recognition skills you'll develop will kick in automatically at times, even when you're not uh, working on a design project or in a design context. And that's when it gets really fun. I've had times where I'm out or I'm sitting somewhere or I'm driving somewhere or I'm at some location and I see something and my mind thinks something, but it's not what I saw. It's just what it could be. That's when it gets really fun. So the more you do this, the more you develop those skills. So uh, give these methods a try. See what you can come up with. The exercise files for each of my People of Process movies can always be accessed via a link in the description below. A big thank you to those who have and to those who have also become members as well. You help me to continue make to continue making content for this channel and I appreciate your support. I really do. So until next time, thank you for watching. People love process. And as always, I hope this content helps you improve your own creative process.